One thing that uh, uh, started us out uh, when, when we were at MIT was really uh, a, a professor called Amy Smith, and she's a MacArthur Grant awardee. And basically, she was saying, how is it possible that most of the students in this university, and if you think around the world, are so focused on the 10% richest of society <laughs> that uh, they're leaping forward in leaps and bounds, which, which means better architecture for their houses, better cars, be, you know, which is not bad. I mean, uh, we, do, we do need that. But what happens when you know, the brain power of all the next generation and the past generation has been focused on that? What happens to the other 90%? So what was interesting was she's saying, OK, you know, we all live our normal lives, our professional lives. So what she was saying is, what if we dedicate a portion of our lives, or you know, just a couple of months, not a portion, but a couple of months, just getting a bunch of students, getting a bunch of you know, these, these, these uh, brain power, and then just dedicating it for, you know, instead of high tech, uh, expensive, high returns on investment, what if it's just low technology, appropriate technology, inventing basically for the poor, and what would that look like on a high impact basis? And, and this started out in, in 2006, and it came out with a class called the, the Development Laboratory. Uh, basically what it did was to gather some of the students in, 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 in the university and just focus on that. And basically, I, this was a, a product of that. Basically, uh, we, are, we abide by three rules, which is, first of all, all materials must be accessible or can be accessible by the poorest community. Second, that the skill level must be something that, you know, it's not high tech, but basic carpentry skills or, or something that can be trained a little above that. But third, charity does not work, and therefore we must make it something that has a livelihood component. That means uh, the purest form of charity, which is of course now called social enterprise, is to make yourself obsolete. How do you empower them so much, interest them so much, that they can actually uh, make it in something that they consistently do and earn out of it. So very simply, it, it came out from this model, which was from the Schwab, that we always expected large corporations, large foundations to handle the problems of the world. Like if it's large, you need a large organization to, to solve it. But really what they used was a very cash burn kind of method. A hundred thousand people, hundred or hundred thousand people hungry, Therefore, let's put up a hundred packets of food, and then you know once that's extinguished, uh, you know they'll raise funds again. So we were approaching it uh, on a very linear fashion, which is when the problem arises, we will come up with you know like a fundraising show or rock concert, and you know we'd, we'd, we'd raise funds for that, and it really good, good, looks good on a brochure. But the thing there is. You know, how come this is not addressing the fundamentals of poverty? How come in a very, you know, in a, in a world with so much charity, with so much giving and so much, you know, so much events happening every week for a cause of, for the benefit of, how come poverty is rising? So linear cannot be the way to attack poverty when it's, it needs an escalating or a dynamic kind of system. So those three rules is what we abide, uh, uh, you know, we try to abide for. And so what we really saw was in the world, it was really uh, just like an enterprise that uh, we wanted to come up with a small amount of money, not take it for granted, which is, you know, burn it, which is one minus, you know, one dollar minus one dollar zero. And then we'd have to spend 70% of our charity life, you know, like raising the funds again and then go through that thing again. But but really what we wanted to do is, how can it be one plus one and then two plus two? How, how, can it, how can it have that dynamic of business? And the most important really was, how can it operate not just like a company, you know, corporate day, we all come to help, we all come to clean once a year, and then we'll see you again next year. You know, thank you, let's all gather together. And so how can, we, how can we make it more dynamic? How can we have a business that runs or a, 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 a project that runs 24-7? And the best one was really uh, the, ideal, the ideal vision when this whole thing started is how can we use the present social network with this kind of empowerment? And instead of having a million dollar foundation helping thousands of people, can we actually have a foundation of like 20 people helping a million people a year? And so when you see later on uh, how it evolved, 
we were starting to see how we could help the people first. How can we replicate it, uh, you know, different areas around the country without us being there by make it having a business, you know, a business kind of uh, system. But more or less, our, our, the, the, the really holy grail that we were trying to do is, can a foundation operate in this new technology, which is uh, like an uh, NGO 2.0, <laughs> where we can actually empower them by being remotely accessible instead of the funds coming to us, like help us, you know, channel the funds to them, can we just defragment it? So the, the presentation I have today is really, uh, yes, I'm going to show you about <coughs> what, what we do, but what, we, what, what I wanted really to, to talk about the social enterprise is the evolution of social enterprise wherein we have to be there, we have to teach them with appropriate technologies, we have to empower them, but gradually moving to this new dynamic, which is we really don't have to be there. All that we have to do is figure out what technologies could be available anywhere in the world at any time, uh, accessed by an individual, accessed by a group, or accessed by a corporation, and just basically hit that one million people a year. And so it's not the solar light that we're going to talk to you about today, but really it's the system whereby the new generation of NGO is so empowered that they can actually not have the funds really to do it, but find people with the funds anywhere in the world to replicate what we're doing. So that's it. So uh, our, 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 our inspiration really was, you know, of course, Mohamed Nudus, the way he came up with, you know, the poorest of the poor uh, could be, you know, empowered uh, and in fact more, rep, you know, in fact more uh, reliable in terms of payment to the bank, 97, 98%. So, you know, the poorest of the poor, uh, and, and, and that's what, what we had to get over as students because you would find this, like this, uh, this, this, this uh, I would call it the urban legend, where most of people that are from wealthy families or, from, you know, good backgrounds, good schools, do not want to help or do not want to cross the, the railroad because basically, you know, the poor are dishonest. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll rob you, they'll not, you know, they'll not work with you, they'll, you know, they'll just ask stuff from you and it will be a never-ending thing. So but the thing there is you ask your friend, like, who told you this? Oh, my friend told me this. And then I ask him, you know, who told you this? Have you ever worked with the poor? And then, you know, all the doubt. So there's this, there's this feeling that, you know, the poor is going to be this, this money pit <coughs> that's going to just, you know, suck you dry. And so that was one of the things that, that had to be overcome which is basically, no, uh, the more you work with them, the more you'll see that they just want to get out. They're willing to work with you. They're willing to you know, help you out. And so this was the, basically the, the, the transition that also personally I came up with, which was the poor is one of the most dynamic, the most helpful. They will actually work with you. They'll actually, in fact, invent with you. They'll actually make things work for you. They'll teach you how things will work. So, the, 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 the work here is actually, yes, it's like 40% ours, but really 60% them teaching us how it could be done better. So let's get straight to the, the, the point. Uh, why, why, why shelter? It's because uh, in our part of the world, uh, climate change is, you know, whether you believe it or not, uh, we do have these kind of storms that are increasing in, in strength and, of course, damages. We're number three in the world when it comes to death and property loss. Just, you know, the changes every year. So whether you want to measure it or not, or, you know, you believe it or not, in, in our point, it's very technical. The storms are getting stronger. Uh, structures built in the 1960s are just collapsing. And the worst thing is most of the structures that are collapsing are class, rural classrooms. And these places are the bomb shelters or the places where people run to in, you know, in case of storms. When their houses don't ho hold up, they run all to this. So what we wanted to do is basically, how do you, how do you shelter like millions of people that needs to be displaced, millions of people that needs to go out of areas that are flooding, you know, you have, you have high, high tide, you know, flooding certain areas. So how do you move a million people or, you know, millions of people that, you know, there's not even land for them, how do you move that? So, it wasn't really alternative architecture, but re re basically, how do we make them build their own shelters and build it stronger? So, I think you've seen all of this, uh, climate changes. So, we have dryness. And so, what we wanted to do is, how uh, do, we, do, we, do we handle this in a, in a social enterprise way? Do we, you know, do we do this thing uh, post-storm? 
which is, you know, we, we love these pictures when, you know, after the storm, you have this Red Cross running with, you know, millions of dollars of food and millions of dollars of, 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 of you know, of, of, of clothes and medical aid. But the point is we do it every year. You know, after a while, you know, you've got, to, you've got to think that this is just a practice that happens every year. It's like, especially with climate changes, you will see that every year it seems to be, you know, we might as well start renting rock concert halls for charity, like, in a head. So what, what we're thinking of is, how do you do post-storm? I mean, it's nice when it comes from a developed world, like, you know, Australia, help us. But, you know, it's got, we've got to stop this kind of, like, always, like, we didn't know it was going to be a storm. But how do you move it from post-storm, where you spend millions and billions of consumables, which is eaten, used, uh, you know, and expended, into post, uh, in pre-storm? If you can act before the storm, build concrete, you know, concrete infrastructure, then we save us from doing it every year, you know. So that was what, what the thesis was. Can, 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 can a country that gets hit, you know, across, you know, acro across the, the northeast area, how can you prepare all of these people at the same time? And then, you know, when, 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 when there is storms and there's a lot of people that are displaced, you will just see pockets of people, you know, you'll see nice pictures of people being helped, you know, like small little pockets. But how could we empower them? So that was, you know, that was what my, my, my thesis was. And so you'd see the storms that, you know, it would look like spaghetti. So it so just show that, you know, the storms are increasing. And worst off, you know, it's getting more intense. So I just wanted to go through that. But really, uh, what inspired us uh, in 2006 was can, can social enterprise be used for, uh, for shelter or preventive shelter? And what we wanted to focus on was, can we create the next generation schools in a, in a very social enterprise kind of way? So uh, this would be brand new, you know, brand new constructions. They're still, you know, you would think, oh, maybe they live in huts, but you know, they live in cement, steel, and glass. But uh, it's just the design. When you start hitting 260 kilometers per hour, all of these things just get flattened. So this is a brand new school. Uh, it had about 70 people inside. Uh, when it was flattened by the storm. So this is, this is, you know, this is like the front lines. We're, we're considering like front lines of climate change. So usually uh, with any refugee, for the next two years, they either live in tents or whatever. So, so it's cumulative, irreversible, uh, it's global. So uh, I want to show you something that, you know, we went to the site and this was this community just flattened out and in the middle was this Spanish church, you know, and, and we didn't really see it at first. We were like, you know, we just, it's been there for the last 350 years. It's gone through storms, gone through rain. And we were just thinking like, you know, uh, of course we did something illegal. We actually took a piece of the church and we wanted to like find out, you know, what it was made out of, you know, before they didn't have like large transportation. And so we were saying, uh, how could we how could we use this kind of old technology when cement, steel, and glass is not something that can be replicated or affordable? How can we do this in a more uh, you know systematic way? So we 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 got inspiration from uh, uh, one of our professors. Uh, he came to MIT and his name was Nadir Khalili, and he worked out of basically with earth, uh, silica, ash, and lime, and he was able to build these structures that would withstand you know even up to 400 kilometer per hour storms be able to withstand, you know, able to withstand earthquakes. And we said, you know, this is exactly how the Spanish did it. What if we can create a social enterprise out of it? So uh, we replicated it and just saw that, you know, that uh, we wanted to build something that was aerodynamic. <laughs> so so we, 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 we started seeing what are the costs, what are the costings of, of, of such a structure? And we found out that it's actually, you know, with simple tools and earth under their feet. It was something like one fourth to one fifth of the cost. Of course, labor intensive, but the thing there is the thing worked. And so what we did was we tried to see uh, what what were the things. Uh, well, I wanted to show you a video very quickly of, of what we did. Basically, we we didn't build this. This was you know this is ours. But what what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a, a business where. The, the, the most of the country's money was going into classrooms or rebuilding classrooms. So what we said is, what if a group of people, uh, you know, fishermen, uh, farmers, what if we taught them 
how to become contractors. But they would always win the contracts because they would build one fourth cheaper than anybody on the islands or on the hills. So how, how would we do that? So uh, our first our first way of doing it was we want we con we we created a group of grassroots contractors. We call them middle ground construction, and basically we said. If you could outbid any contractor because you could build better and stronger, uh, what would it look like? So I'll just want, I wanted to show you this video of how we started. Uh, play. What we want, what we wanted to do, was really find out, like, is is there something where uh, we could, you know, instead of spending, let's say, uh, a construction cost like three thousand dollars, what we really wanted to do is, can we create a construction company out of the three thousand dollars? That you know, after we do this, uh, that we do it once or we do it twice, but after that they keep on building, but they 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 use the contracts or bidding for contracts, but still build the same kind of classrooms and. And it worked really well. Uh, currently, we have about a hundred of these like uh, soil classrooms that have been got, gone up in the hillsides of Mindanao, and basically we, we always beat them because if you can provide three times the floor area, and you can make it twice as strong or three times as strong, uh, you know these these are massive. This like you know seventy inch uh, walls. Then you can create a construction company that could you know, and especially on the islands where you know you have to understand that we're an archipelago. So a lot of the construction materials have to be trucked, have to be, you know, there, there's a barge that brings it over. So by the time it reaches the islands, uh, we're 7,100 islands. Uh, and some of them sink at, at night, at night uh, during uh, the high tide. But uh, it, it becomes so small, so expensive that, you know, and, and so cheap. Sometimes they mix a lot of sand in it just, you know, to, to, to be able to profit, still profit. So what we were thinking about is just change the whole thing around and create this new kind of dynamic construction companies and I'm going to I'm going to tell you more about what we do but really where they build it on site they have unlimited materials and then the, the best thing there is you have to understand is why we're so passionate about this kind of things where we build it on site is that most of the money actually stays in the area whereas the old way is you'd come in you'd have you know this this you know this this uh, a lot of funds come in build a structure uh, have nothing to do with the community. Just you know, just stand aside. We're gonna just build it and then just leave. So our point is, uh, since we're community organizers, we see that cash flow is important in the community, especially when you're gonna build like social structures. The more money that the community <coughs> has to send out to build these structures, the poorer the community becomes. The more money that is left in the community, the richer the cash flow that 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 that, that occurs there. So look at it not as infrastructure. Look at it as cash flow. So. We train them, we, most of the money is left behind, and the third thing is they, they keep on building, and they keep on building with money that comes in. So uh, we also do this for roofing tiles. So instead of having to import large amount of roofs, which are the most expensive ones, uh, we use uh, traditional tile making, uh, uh, tile making traditions. Uh, that way they can actually uh, build without welding, just with simple cement, uh, these are about three and a half inches thick. Uh, but the, the, the amazing thing there is you create, you know, the, the most difficult systems, which is, and the most expensive ones, which is you can create roofing, you know, for high, you know, high velocity winds without ever having to weld a single piece. And you can replicate this thing all over. So uh, what you have to see here is when you want to help, what is that unlimited solution? You know, you just don't want to help them uh, to just create that solution. But what you want is, once you do it, what's an unlimited solution so that, you know, way, way beyond your gun or way, way beyond the, the, fund, the funding for intervening is gone, what keeps on making them help themselves? So that is the way that we're creating, creating clinics uh, across the country. Uh, it looks like any regular clinic. It's, it's, it's stronger than any regular clinic. But the thing there, it's made out of 90% out of stuff that is just dug out of the mountain. So you cannot use this on planes because you'll create a lot of pools. You know? So we use this only, this, we use the, the earthen techniques only for the, 
for the school. So I just want to show you uh, how we build the school. So rice bags, and then instead of mortar, we use uh, we use um, barbed wire to hold it together. So even in an earthquake, it does not crack. We use uh, the tile technology for the roofing. So you'll see here. And then, of course, it's waterproof. But you know, the nice thing is they're simple farmers, uh, fishermen. They just fill in the sacks, and then they wait for it to dry. And then after about two days, you can burn out the sacks. And there you have it, your traditional old tech, old technology, you know, left behind, you know, just because, you know, the Western area, and I say Western, I mean modern architecture, not Western, mm -hmm. but modern architecture came in. You know, all of these traditional ways that, that, that was so successful in the past uh, was gone. But I, I'm saying you have to, you know, all of these things are with modern science. That means with this all tested, we mix, you know, we, we mix new kinds of silica ash and lime. We test these things. We don't just, you know, come up with all this. But, it work, the thing that it works. Uh, they're 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 you know they're cool in the su cool in the summer. Uh, I'm not there's no winter, but you know they're they're very stable. They're very stable. They've been used several times in you know some of the worst storms in the country. Uh, but they look you know they look really good. I mean they're, they're just they're just stunning pieces of you know of, of architecture. Uh, at the same time, you know, they're they're great for you know for for the kids. They're, it's cool, so it's like you know the, the the heat from the sun doesn't come in. But you know, it, the thing that it works, and it's you know as I said, one fourth cheaper. So we built like you know almost almost how many? 10, 10, 10 to eleven schools. I don't know because the thing there is they keep on building without us, and 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 the best thing there is. They'll keep on building way, way beyond they forgot they, they, they would have forgotten about us. Whereas for sometimes people when they give, they're so enamored by the fact that, you know, I'm giving to you and the fact that, you know, the next time you want, I can give to you again. And so they like this kind of thing. But the thing there is if 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 you are so needed in the solution, then maybe maybe you're you're really part of the problem because you know, everybody wants to line up to you, everybody wants to see your logo, everyone wants to see your your patronage, when really, if you really wanted to help, and help in a big way, then maybe one day they might not even know your name, but the thing there is it, it stands because of you, and isn't that enough? And so that was the dream, that you know, one day these things will pop up all over the country, it doesn't matter, but the thing there is so many people are, you know, so many children are in good schools, in strong schools, and you know, are safe from the storms. Mm -hmm. So coming from that, uh, we came up, I'll just skip this, but we came up with one of the worst areas that were hit, and uh, we came up with something that, you know, so this is by the mountainside. The next one was really, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing up my slides, but we were trying, the, the second one we're doing, which is, I'll, I'll show you later, the, the bamboo schools, but we were saying, okay, if this is the, the, if this is the amount for the classrooms, we will make it like five times more disaster resilient. So some of my MIT you know, uh, I don't know if you've seen that Apollo project where, you know, they, they were running out of oxygen and they had to figure out what to do with pieces of, you know, like rubber and, you know, figure out how to make an uh, oxygen scrubber or something. They were running out of oxygen. So I was telling my friends in NASA, I said, guys, you know, you can launch a space, like a shuttle into space. What about, this is the, this is the materials that are available uh, for building a school. The problem is they collapse at you know 160 kilometers per hour. Can you make it last till up 300 kilometers per hour? So you know they, they got to work, and the point was if we could do that, then we can create another company that just builds this kind of school. So for the same amount that the Department of Education was paying for schools that were you know that were getting destroyed all the time, I was saying you know we'll just do this once and we'll guarantee it for the next you know 50 years that it will not it will not crash. So basically, they came up with this. Of course, now we kind of edited it. Uh, we're finishing our, our first ones, but it slides to the side. But uh, it's great for you know like a, a, like an amphitheater, you know, for sports. But really, during storms, it would slide down and just you know how tents in the in the in, 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 in the in the Himalayas they would be made of thin fabric, but because they go all the way to the ground, it never has this vacuum to pull up the the roof. So. These are the stuff, kind of stuff when you start thinking like how do we do it with what we have and how do we do it with what's there. That's the kind of things that you know when you when you keep on like thinking, okay, not based on the budget, but based on the vision. What's the vision? 
The vision is to make yourself obsolete. The vision is uh, how to make that structure better with little with the same amount of funds or make it three times to four times the floor area. So this is the thing about the, the creative things about learning about social enterprises because you know when you push yourself a little bit, then you start realizing you know uh, of course I'll I'll not admit to you really what we had to go through like one out of five. You know, I want, I'm not going to show you the failure, that one out of five works. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the journey, you know. I'm not telling you that, you know, we're perfect, but really we've come up with some stuff like the dog scrubber that, you know, that really hurt the dog. <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we, we're trying to make, you know, like the, the, the automatic dishwashers for restaurants. <laughs> there are things in our, you know, in our, in, our, in our laboratory that will never see the light of day. But what I'm saying is one out of five, if you invent it, you know, uh, my professor once said, you know, uh, in a business, uh, never turn your back from things that bother you. Because if they bother you, you possibly bother a lot of other people. And if you can figure out the product or, you know, the thing that the better service that works, then you have a really great business option. But how about in society? I mean, stuff that bothers you, are the lines long? Art is the food cold. I mean, sorry, at the line, you know, is, is people hungry? Uh, are, are, you know, are, are, you know is, is people getting sick or they're not being sheltered? If you can come up with something really cool, you could change the world. And so that was, that's the same kind of things. So what are the things that bother you and what are the things that would work? So one of the things that bothered us, of course, is plastic. And so, yeah, so plastic, uh, it just never goes away. We have uh, plastic, uh, Bags, we have cans, 500 years, glass bottle, 1,000 years. But you know, even though you have that recycling thing in the developing world, there's really no recycling centers. It's just none, especially in the islands. What they do when they run out of trash space is they wrap it up in plastic bags and they float it with the mm -hmm. tide. So I don't know where that goes. I know there's this great trash patch in the ocean, but maybe, you know. Maybe we contribute to that because we, there's no places for these things to go. And so there's a profit incentive to bring it on the island, sell it to the tourists, sell it to the people living there. But there's no incentive when it comes to nothing. So how do you change that? How do you change from something without value into something that makes absolute value? And so one of the things that we wanted to do was focus on that never-ending plastic bottle. So. We wanted, instead of recycle, which was not available, why? Because it takes so much money to pick it all up, to have a center to, con to burn it, to convert it, and to make it into new bottles and to send it back. There's just not enough money in the developing world to do that. So it ends up in our junkyard. So one of the things with social enterprises, remember the model where we want people to become construction, you know, to, to enter into the construction market, which is actually the most valuable market. So we get volunteers and of course people that are, you know, uh, especially the, the women folk and we fill bottles, actually lots of bottles, and we start stacking them and they make like great housing. Uh, just think of the unlimited potential uh, for creating, you know, what is the biggest problem into something with a huge, you know, huge solution. And so one of the things that we're focusing on is just using it for flooring, and uh, using it for school. So there's enough trash, there's really enough trash every month that is thrown away by a town to create a classroom. So th the point is, they're just free. At the same time, we use, you know, like local labor to build it. So we have this huge, con you know, not huge, but you know, we have this kind of great construction company we're in its grassroots. It's not, you know, it, of course we use, the best, we use architects that donate their time. We use, you know, we use engineers. But the thing there is we, we systematize it that anywhere around the country that they need schools, we can actually create, uh, because they have these recycling centers or recycling pro mm -hmm. programs in each of the, the towns. So we just use that. It's deposited in our, in our backyard and we create, you know, we create all of these classrooms. So the thing there is, you know, uh, these unlimited solutions with, uh, you know, with, with, with something that has, you know, if you look at the budget, there's just not enough. But if you use an enterpri enterprise solution and you use, a, you know, this alternative technology that it works. Now, we, we, I, want, I wanted to show you something by Jack Brandis, another <laughs> one, where people do peanuts. They have, you know, it's a source of protein. 
uh, I, I had an R, so I'm just putting, it's, it's a foundation with several, with several uh, uh, it's just like any corporate, they have, pro, you know, they have, you know, products. Well, we have, we, we have people, we have, you know, we have uh, appropriate technologies that goes under. So we have about, uh, I think about 12, 12, uh, 12 sub, sub offices where it, it handles this around the country. So instead of uh, peeling by hand, Jock Brandis invented something that is called, uh, this is like, this is about uh, $7,000. So it's about cement. So it cements widely available. They put it in, uh, in uh, molds and they come up with this. This one shells peanuts at 50 kilo kilos an hour. So it's th what they do is you just put it in and you rotate it by hand and it finds a perfect, you know, a perfect fit in, in the, the two cement. There's one inside, one outside that, that just cracks the peanuts. And so there, so all these women that have to like spend about two weeks, like, you know, how many hours just opening up peanuts? And they do that in, you know, they really do that by hand. Uh, they just do like this and then they rent it. They, they build it. So, yeah, so instead of, uh, instead of having to do it, they now, they now open, they now open it. Uh, but the best part is even the men, they can now sell it. So this kind of stuff. There's now about, I think, 20 to 30,000 of these all around the country. Uh, we invented a new one, which is you can bike, and it just, just, flies, just flies out. So uh, this is one of uh, a really funny one. Uh, and really, uh, w women in the developing world uh, it's actually our, our biggest seller. We have a new model, but uh, women in the developing world, without money, without capital, what they do is they go house to house asking if they can like wa wa wash clothes. And so when we're thinking of, look at this, I mean, you have all these women, they're just sitting down, like crouched down, and they have a little stool, and sometimes they're in the dark bathroom, so it, you know, the and at the same time, their hand is in lye, it's in this toxic lie the whole time. So they get not only scoliosis, but at the same time, they, they, their hand is in the toxic water. So what we wanted to do is, can we make them wash? And then we have a dryer. There's actually a dryer in this. And just make them healthy. You know, like bike it, earn the same amount of money, uh, but at the same time, you know, get the, get, the job, get the job done. And so that's what they would do. And at the same time, the men can also use it without feeling this kind of, you know, feeling that they are, you know, and this will help the developing world. You guys can be fit by, by you know, one day we'll invent one just for you. But you can not only wash your clothes, but you can, you know, you don't have to go to the gym. <laughs> but it, it, wor it works. There are a lot of very, you know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, you know, why, why, why split it, no? Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, so that's what they're doing now. So they wash, they dry. Uh, the reason why you want it, the water to dry is because then you can hang it for a shorter amount of time and then bring it to the customers by day's end instead of waiting the next day. So uh, that's, 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 that's how we do it. That's how we do it. So, well, to show you just how much, you know, it's foam. But okay, now going to, uh, yeah, this quality. That. So um, the next generation that we were really thinking of before the solar bottles, of course we were building the schools, but remember the objective when we started out was this dream. <coughs> what would it take for a small foundation to help a million people a year? I mean, you know, how can we leverage new technologies? And so we started out with this. It's, it's, it, it's called the cement water pump, also by <coughs> John Brandis, my professor. And so we wanted something that anywhere in the world you could just, you know, pump water up three meters up and or three meters, up, uh, three meters from the ground or three meters up. And so it's something that you just mold in cement. Remember, cement is just the most, the easiest material to mold. And basically, you just like a cake, you know, like an oven, and basically it comes out. And I say that if you just move side to side, and the water just you know, it just goes up. And so we were thinking, what if we just make the molds available? Anywhere you are in the world, we'll just give you the molds and you can replicate it ad infinitum. It, it's going slow, but it's working. But this is why we're all here, which is the fact that, you know, uh, finally we found something that's going to hit or even surpass a million people a year. And, and what, what, is, what is this? 
basically uh when we were building when we were building the when we were building the the bottle school one of the principal things that we tend to overlook with being so great at building cheap kind of infrastructure is the fact that you build it so cheaply that they end up having to power it with fans if it's hot or just with lights because it's just so dark you know you build a cheap a cheap you know uh, 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 common common uh, common wall and then after that what you would do is you just put a metal sheet on that and say wow perfect for the next 25 to 30 years except the consumption of electricity and you know just to keep it cool is so hot is so high that you can actually build two more houses in the next 10 years if you just designed it properly so we could not redesign we could not redesign it all so what we wanted to do is how could we make it better so when we were building the bottle school one of the things we started doing was filling up uh, the walls in, in, in you know in in in, uh, in the bottle school instead of soil filled it up with water and this started the light to enter into the into the area so this is something that reflected also uh, in the developing country people are saying you know why are they turning on the lights during the day it's like we, we we don't notice it we just come into a room and we just switch on the lights it's the same thing also in in poor areas the the it, in fact it's more dense or if you think about it our rooms are dense uh, and, and basically there, there's no light that enters or if you have a window people tend to use that as a pathway and so people are always passing by so they just close the shutter so most of them have incandescent bulbs and so what is the cost of using incandescent bulbs uh, it, it's the fact that you know they are paying for money that could have otherwise been used for nutrition been used for education so what we're saying is if we could just save enough money you know, it's great to have you know an overall uh, idea, which is let's just give them all solar lights. But if you really think about the impact of this kind of imported solar technologies, manufactured abroad, patents, costs, plus the interest rates, unless it's subsidized. In fact, even where it's manufactured in the country itself, some people can't even afford it. So imagine when it comes to a developing country, you're looking at when we calculate it, it's like. You know, we have these huge windmills. We have, you know, I don't know how many billion pesos, but if you really look at it, the cost of electricity is just so high. It's, so it's not, you know, beating out on, 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 on fuel. So what we're saying is while we're waiting for, you know, while we're waiting for fuel prices or, you know, this technology to become cheaper, why don't we do something just completely our own, which is let's just make a gra revolution from the grassroots. Why do we have to, you know, rely on, you know, cheaper technologies abroad when really let's start at first with you know what can, what can we do what can we do now instead of the 0 0.03 percent what if what if we can just empower the whole 90 percent so that's where the dream came out really to come up with this you know uh, daylight powered natural light uh inexpensive uh we once again the rule was you have to use uh, it's a tough rule but you have to use whatever whatever is found there uh, it must be easy to assemble because it has to become a business. It has to become a business for the people there, and at the, at it must have this huge impact. So once again, our love for plastic bottles came to the fore. <laughs> floor, uh, we have much more stuff with the plastic bottles, but uh, yeah, we wanted something that could be accessible. So plastic bottles and tin, and the most important one really is we wanted you know how. Uh, the next generation of jobs will be green jobs, but you're talking about manufacturing installation. What about the developing world? What if the next generation of jobs, especially for the poorest, was green jobs? What will that look like? So this guy, uh, about five months ago, he was unemployed. He had a family of three. Uh, he could not. His electricity was cut. Today he has a better. You know he has a, he has a better house. Uh, he has made 8,000 solar bulbs. He is like, you know, he's now, regard, he's now installing it in other communities and he has, a, he has an ongoing business. So it actually works. I, I wanted to show another video, just, just I think you might have seen it, but I wanted to show you how uh, we are now using grassroots entrepreneurs to spread this and make a business out of it. And you know, in fact, you know, uh, once it starts, once you bring people in to show them what this kind of light can do, it saves it saves about ten dollars ten dollars a month. Uh, it costs about a dollar to build, 
And the best thing there is it's built by the community for the community. So I'm just going to show you. So what we did was uh, after that, after it, no, wait, sorry. It, it actually went beyond our expectation. It hit like 1.7 million views by about, I think about 40 countries. It just on went YouTube. Huh? On, on, YouTube. On, on, on YouTube, on YouTube. So I said, what, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you get that many inquiries? It was just overflowing. So we started saying, let's just give it all away. But the thing there is just teach them how the business is made. Let's teach them how to do it. So an individual, a group, or an organization can do that. So uh, I'll just make this very short. We, we, wanted, we wanted it so anti-NGO. Uh, we found out that 70% were young. They, were, they just had so much trouble feeling disempowered, coming up with so much money to help people. We said, with one dollar, you can change the lives of people. We wanted it rocking. <laughs> we wanted to have rock, rock concerts. Well, you know, it's love to sing. And we love to sing. I don't want to sing this because I lose my, you know, my 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 invite to it. <laughs> now, the amazing thing that's happening here is. Is, is, what we were actually trying to do is, if we can empower one guy to make 8,000 solar bulbs and earn out of it, what if we can use the Habitat model? What if we can get just like 300, 400 student volunteers with, you know, with the rocky music, with, with something that they, they know it works? Because sometimes, you know, when, 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 when people feel, want to feel empowered, they go to rock concerts with a cause. And then after the last strains, it's like, Change is up to you. You know, it's like it's your. You know, you, you can do the change. Be part of the change. Wear this button. You know, it's like, and so you know, for 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 in in, in, in our in our work, it's like, wait a minute. The P, PR agencies seem to be taking over the NGO world, but they don't know what the hell they're doing. It's like you know, they're coming up with people to come together. But at the end, you know, they're leaving them dry. So a lot of the jadedness of young people comes from this. You make them think they're going to change the world. And then at the end, it's too complicated to ever do anything. And so, so it's donate your money or donate your time. But you know what? You're not going to be part of the change. Just wear a t-shirt. Just rock it, you know? I'm WWF. <laughs> but, but, but I'm saying, it's, they do, they do, WWF. I'm just saying, but... There are a lot of, you know, we've gone so much into the awareness for the last 20 years, you know, feeling good about awareness that, you know, we've practically forgotten how to do grassroots change. What will, you know, what, what, what really needs to be done? So what we're doing is getting like, you know, like 400 students, get them to, get them to come in, get them to do this. But then, you know, you're talking about we can make, we can help, we can do a thousand, we can do a, a thousand houses in a day. Can you understand how that works? It's like you can change the lives of a thousand people a day. And that's not just a day. That's for the next 10 years. They're going to have, you know, uh, their electricity bills will be halved. They say, you know, $10 is, is, you know, $10 or more is half, you know, if you start multiplying. And the thing there is they're going to have it for the next 10 years. And the thing there is, anybody, anybody around will be able to do it. So, uh, what has this done? Well, we have people writing to us about what kind of, you know, what kind of numbers we're, they're looking at. And so, what's happening now is, around the country, uh, we started out, we started out with one about five, you know, five months ago. We're now hitting fifteen thousand. 
by November 30, in one day, we will we have a massive drive. We're using the army. We're actually I actually convinced the the Philippine <laughs> army to lend me their people. You know, lend me your ears. Let lend me 30 trucks, and at the same time, we have 10,000 bulbs being manufactured in a penitentiary. So the money does not is not really built by us. The, the the bulbs is not really done by us. But what we're doing is we're giving it to the people that are scavenging and the people in the penitentiary, and they're doing thousands. So built by the poor, for the poor. So they're building it for us, and at the same time, we're using the army to dis disperse it to, 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 to 30 communities in 17 cities, all in the same day. And we have volunteers over there with drills and, and rivets, because it's not, it's not high tech. And so on December 10, we're gonna do something even more radical. In two days, we're going to hit 100,000 in the island of Cebu because it's saving you know, almost 50% of their bills. So you're talking about while we're waiting for technologies to come down, here's this development model that's coming in and it's just radically being replicated everywhere around the country and doing real good. I'm talking about, you know, not only, okay, but by end of the year, we'll hit 200,000. If you put $10 on that, that's $2 million. In a year, that will be $24 million of savings. So you have to understand what numbers we're talking. It looks simple, but the numbers are not simple. So um, once again, we use unemployed. It's, it's not high tech. It's human tech. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not complicated tech. It's everybody, everybody tech. You know, uh, we have, you know, we have, we have children asking their fathers, hey, look, we have bottles. Can we make a solar bulb for the next door? You know, see, we have we have groups of young children, you know, gathering bottles and doing it themselves. In fact, we're opening up three offices. Uh, one is going to be in Vietnam, one is going to be in South Africa, and one of them going to be in South America. And we're just giving them the technology. And now, the nice thing with multinationals is hopefully we can like tap into them. Can you sponsor us here? But if you sponsor us here, you must sponsor us there. So we can replicate this whole thing. So we don't know where this is going, but at two hundred thousand in what? So. Uh, we're talking November, December, so five, seven, eight months. We're gonna hit two hundred thousand easily, one million. So our dream: can an NGO functioning with you know appropriate technologies in a social you know in a in, in a network you know world? Can it help you know? Can it help a million? And the answer is you know yes. We can we can do something so radical that you can get 55 watts, save money that can be used for goods, so even in the smallest uh, uh, chain, you know, marketing chain, you know, they can use it instead of spending it on light. Uh, so that's it. Our thing is, in social action, can we think of something that lasts longer than us? I'm sure that one day, when they build a roof, it's gonna be just you know, understood that they need to put a solar bulb in it. They might not remember us, they might not remember where it came from, but I think it's just gonna be logical. And the nice thing there is they can go to their local solar bulb maker and have it made and not wait for somebody in the develop, you know, to, hey, can you send in a truck to help us? So w this is what we want. So a million, uh, you could see easily how it works. You come in, five minutes, that's it. Uh, bathrooms are biggest customers. And the nice thing about these things is white light. When they come in, it's healthier. It produces vitamin D in the body, so uh, it's it's healthier than yellow fiberglass. And it's of course the heat doesn't come in, uh, but this is the gift from darkness into light. And the thing there is, once you give light uh, to these people, they will never want to go back into darkness again. So that's the gift of social enterprise. And if you find that problem that has a unique solution, but the best one is a solution you can give away then you can change the world. That's my experience. Thank you. Thank you.